We are to distinguish between trial of faith and chastisement. In the former case, we readily bow and bring forth fruits of grace. But if we be rebellious, we are under correction. Paul's thorn in the flesh was God's gift to preserve him from pride, although it was the messenger of Satan to buffet him. Thus God uses the wicked one for our profit, for the glory of his all-sufficient grace, and for the tempter's confusion. Our trials are needful now for the exercise and growth of faith, and no less needful for our joy and glory at the appearing of the Lord. Temptation to sin is painful to us, only as we are sanctified by the Spirit of grace and walk with God. We ought not to wish for deliverance from the trial until the trial has done its office. Shall the gold be taken out of the furnace before the dross has been consumed? Faith's expectation in the day of trouble is large showers of blessing. Sorrow and temptation are the seeds of joy and praise. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Psalm 126, verse 5 Confidence in God proves itself in time of trial. It grows in the day of battle. David in the valley of Elah was most bold when the giant cursed him and drew nigh to slay him. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We have oneness with Christ. We have faith and the Spirit. What more then do we need but the trial of faith and the Spirit's fellowship? If we have a steadfast purpose to overcome temptation, sooner or later we surely prevail. Abraham, through the weakness of his flesh, did not leave his father when God commanded him to go into the land of Canaan. But it was his steadfast purpose to obey God, so that at the last, when he offered up Isaac, he conferred not with flesh and blood. Are we content to leave our cause in the hands of God? Job should have done this at the first, but by justifying himself, he increased his trouble. James 1-2 Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. There is grace in Christ for our fulfilling the precept. If being tried, I am entangled in unbelief. I cannot count my trial joy. So to do, I must by the Spirit's power resist the tempter. Satan has no pity on us, be we sick or well. If he leave us for a season, it is because the time decreed is spent and he cannot exceed his commission. Faith never expects to learn deep lessons without deep difficulties. Therefore, she is not surprised by strange and dark providences. How many are apt to say, My temptation is peculiar. But we should remember that it is the peculiar aggravations which make a trial effectual and should not forget the word. There has no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. 1 Corinthians 10.13 Our faith is greatly strengthened when we are brought to see that no arm but God's can help. No wisdom but His can guide and no love but his can satisfy. The thickest cloud brings the heaviest shower of blessings. Those very circumstances which make unbelief despond are meat and drink to faith. Satan is employed for God's people, for their discipline, their correction, their sifting, but not for their destruction. Christ often wounds in order to heal. And if he give pain, it is that we may find peace and rest in himself. His wounds are full of kindness and always tend to life and health and peace. We often make this great mistake. We expect in the kingdom of patience what is only promised in the kingdom of glory. And we ask God rather for deliverance from the warfare than grace for it as long as he is pleased that it shall last. 
Our impatience for victory often increases the heat of the battle. To preserve purity of life in time of temptation, we must take constant heed to purity of thought. God has settled in heaven certain trials of our faith, which will as surely befall us as the crown of glory be given us at Christ's appearing. God's purpose of grace are a golden chain. Not a link must be missing. Temptations which find us dwelling in God are to our faith like winds that more firmly root the tree. James 1, 2-4 how much of adversity do we need in order to bring down the lofty thoughts within us? A knowledge of our own weakness is generally learned through humiliation and suffering. Those trials which put our wisdom to confusion thwart our pride and starve the lust of the flesh best fit and enable us to trust the living God. Let us then not suffer such trials to pass without making right use of them giving thanks to God for them all. He is most likely to fall into temptation and sin who most slights a warning. He who most truly depends upon the Lord for succor in the time of temptation will be the most thankful for counsel or reproof. When a trial comes upon me, let me look upon it as sent for a peculiar blessing. If I receive it thus, I shall not consider how heavy it is, nor ask, when will it be removed, but how much advantage shall I gain through it, and how shall I turn it to the best account? Often when saints by right steps bring afflictions upon them, they are tempted to think their course wrong, but faith seizes the opportunity of glorifying God. Thus the apparent loss becomes great sin. Esther 4, 13-16 how much will our trials weigh when this mortal shall have put on immortality and we shall appear with Christ in glory? 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 The troubles of the way do us good service if they raise the eyes of our minds to look at things unseen and eternal. Present faith, not past experience or comfort, keeps us from fainting in the hour of trial. Which of us can be kept near to Christ without some thorn in the flesh? Faith, patience, and prayer can overcome all difficulties. Affliction coming upon God's people is no proof that they are displeasing Him. Is God with them or not is the test. Jeremiah was cast into the dungeon and sank in the mire, but God was with him. Jeremiah 38 So it was with Joseph. Genesis 39, 21 We can never walk with steady step in the time of trial of our faith, save as we are looking onward to the resurrection of the just. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the apostle, in view of it, says, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Difficulties and ill success encourage me. For the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do we meet with unkindness from brethren? Instead of shooting out bitter words at them, let us judge ourselves and endeavor in love and wisdom to overcome evil with good. Is the child of God overwhelmed by the trials of the way and ready to turn his back in the day of battle because of the rage of hellish powers? Let me remind him that Samson first slew the lion and afterwards out of the same lion got honey and to spare. When God gave Paul the thorn in the flesh, he knew not at first the value of the gift and would have cast it away had he been left in his own hands and taught him and us by him that the strength of Christ is made perfect in weakness.
the calling of the church. The church is not only quickened by Christ, but quickened together with him. If this truth were received into the understanding and affections and lived upon daily by the children of God, their very garments would smell of myrrh and frankincense with all powders of the merchant, and their conversation would bespeak their heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. To rise above the first Adam, we must live in the last Adam. We shall then be able in spirit to use the language of the eighth Psalm and have all things under our feet. Our life is in Christ. Therefore, it is eternal life. For Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's design was not only to save us from hell, however great that salvation, but to make us his sons and daughters in order that we, with himself and the Lord Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, might dwell forever in our Father's house. True love has its source in Christ himself. It is therefore bold in defense of his truth and knows no man after the flesh when his honor is to be maintained or defended. We have three chief characteristics to sustain child of God, soldier, and spouse of Christ. We have to feast, to fight, and to sing. Christ has won the victory. We gather up the spoils, and though so doing, we must fight. The victory is ours, and its fruit. To have the Lord Jesus revealed to us by the Spirit of God is enough. It sufficed Stephen amidst his persecutors and suffices us amidst all our difficulties and adversaries, amidst all trials, great and small. God's people are his witnesses. They are the light in this dark world. They should therefore be so filled with the Spirit as to be Christ's epistles known and read of all men. The church has spiritual heavenly eternal life in Christ, her risen Lord, the last Adam. His pierced side is the fountain of life to us, his spouse. We are under the law of God's love and grace in our new relation as children. We are under obligation to Christ as firstborn among many brethren and as his members to obey him as our head. We have often the words, members of Christ, upon our lips. Whether they were always accompanied with reverence and love. Colossians 2.14 Everlasting, all comprehensive, immeasurable, no possibility of condemnation. The bond that was against me is now nailed up, as it were, in the court of justice for the protection of the debtor. I now owe everything to the love of God. I owe my whole self. Let Christ dwell in my heart to guide every glance of the eye, every thought of the mind. How strange would it seem to us to see a prince in sorry garments seated on the ale bench in company with common men. How much greater the inconsistency when a child of the living God, a king and a priest unto God, degrades himself to fellowship with the unregenerate. In order of time, we were in the first man, Adam, the man of the earth, first, but not so in order of purpose and degree. According to this, we were in the last Adam, the second man, the Lord from heaven, ere we fell in the first. Every flock bears the mark of its owner. So the sheep of Christ have their mark, even poverty of spirit. Each one is a poor needy sinner, self-judged and self-condemned, according to the justice of God. For a child of God to talk of his heavenly calling and not to walk according to it, how sad a sight. The moment I am born of God, I am in the world in a new relation, I am a crucified man. 
and that I am, such should be evident to all around. God holds us accountable for what we have, and not for what we have not. If I have only 10 minutes to read the word, do I employ those 10 minutes according to my accountability? Many believers, though they live in New Testament times, walk in the Old Testament spirit. The new creature. The believer in Jesus being created anew has the likeness of God stamped upon him. In nature, the child resembles the parent. There is no feature of the countenance of God the Father, but it is to be found in the feeblest child of grace. 2 Peter 1.4 According to the new man, we crave the knowledge of God's word for the sake of obedience, but the flesh desires knowledge for the vainglorious talk of the lips that tendeth to penury. Proverbs 14, verse 23. As a vessel takes its shape from the mold, so should our will be formed in the mold of the will of God. Then shall we have everything our own way. John 15, verse 7. Christ had no will but the will of his Father, and in his delight, to do that, we will see his perfect holiness. For what is holiness but thy will be done? As the weakness of the old man lies in its vain conceit of its strength, so the strength of the new man lies in its true sense of perfect weakness. God is no respecter of persons, but he will honor them that honor him, whereas they that despise him shall be lightly esteemed. 1 Samuel 2 verse 30. He honors us for his own grace in us and corrects us for our evil ways. Unbelief. Unbelief is oft a hypocrite clothed in a white robe and as an angel of light having the semblance of all humility. But drag him to the light and the monster appears. He would cast down God from his throne and set himself thereon. Where unbelief is, there is pride. And where pride is, her whole brood of evils are to be found with her. So with the obedience of faith, there is humility with all her train. There will be no room for the fretfulness of unbelief. If I only see that he who is the ruler of heaven and earth is my very kinsman, my brother. When a child of God takes an unbelieving step and God suffers it to succeed, this is one of the sharpest corrections he can be visited with. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 2-9 through nine. Let us not nourish unbelief by plans and contrivances of fleshly prudence. One step of unbelief unrepented of leads to another. Hard thoughts of God are, alas, natural to us and swarm in our breast. It is only as the love of God is revealed to us in the cross of Christ that we are able to cast them out. If in great tribulation we are by faith walking upon the flood, we shall seem to the eye of unbelief to be sinking in the flood. If unbelief prevail in saints, they slight the assemblies of God's people. But let us who diligently frequent them be able to say, We have seen the Lord. John 20, verse 25. That will be the best rebuke for the negligent. Unbelief is in man's sight no sin at all, whilst in God's sight it is of all sins the greatest. Whilst we are looking to Jesus at the right hand of God, all circumstances are our occasions for honoring God by faith. But if we look to circumstances and not to Christ, they cast us down and leave us a prey to unbelief. By unbelief the child of God degrades himself. Losing sight of his heavenly robe, he makes much of the earthly rags of this world's honor and can even envy the wearers. 
Psalm 73, verse 3. We do well to remember that God is as true to his forewarnings of wrath and curse as he is to his promises of grace. We take the latter for our peculiar comfort, but should also solemnly meditate the former for our ripe and full acquaintance with God. Unbelief cripples and puts in fear where no fear is. It leads to despair, and despair is but unbelief without a bridle. Do you at the mercy seat confess the iniquity of unbelief? Remember that it makes God to be the very contrary of what He is. Unbelief and its rebellion will make of a mere nothing a great mountain. Every murmuring thought is the child of unbelief and makes God a liar. The Sins of Believers The heart of man is a restless, deep, ever casting up mire and dirt. Isaiah 57 verse 20 but in the sins of God's children, there is a preeminence of guilt. Jonah could not sin himself out of the love of God. Therefore, sinning himself out of communion with God, he had the greater guilt. I count myself more vile than the murderer who suffers death by the hangman's hand, because the atoning blood of the Son of God acquaints me with myself. That which shows me my forgiveness reveals to me my pollution. By far the greater part of the sins of God's children are sins of ignorance. How needful therefore the cry, cleanse thou me from secret faults. Psalm 19 verse 12. Faults hidden from mine own eye and from mine own conscience. Without atoning blood, they would bring down God's curse on the offender's head. O oh, let us not make light of sins of ignorance. The sins of our unregenerate state should indeed be ever before us. But by frowardness, since we tasted that God is gracious, we sin, as natural man cannot sin, against the heart of Christ, against God's love and His Spirit, who seals us unto the day of redemption. The natural man is a rebel against his maker, but it is against the Father that we, the saved, offend. Forgetting the cross, we go astray. The remedy is true and speedy confession, for we have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 2, 1 We must be ever waging war with the secret workings of sin. Where it is but a little measure allowed, God may suffer his child to go further and further in that allowance until the seven locks are shorn on Delilah's lap. To be doubting Christ's love, to be limiting his grace, is alike unworthy of us and grieving to him. The last offense of Joseph's brethren was not the least. Genesis 1, 15-21 there is no fault in our character that the grace of God cannot cure. It becomes us, therefore, to give no quarter to the Canaanites. Judges 2 God deals with us after conversion, otherwise than before it. He, as a wise father, has a rod of correction for his children, and smites them when he might let them alone. Did they not know his love? Peculiar temptations bring forth peculiar corruptions after neglected warnings. The Lord Jesus took loving pains to make Peter acquainted with himself and was compelled to humble him by his threefold denial of his Lord, but without exposing him to the eye of enemies. Overcome by a sudden temptation, he was quickly forgiven and restored. Luke 22, 55 through 62. Whereas David, who had deliberately transgressed and who had long been in a backsliding state of heart, was exposed to the people as well as made loathsome in his own eyes. 2 Samuel 12, 16. 
When Christ restores a fallen one, he often makes that disciple stronger than before his fall. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Luke 22, 32. So it will be with those who, like David and Peter, have been wont to follow the Lord fully. The people of God are in general slack and slothful in searching out sins of ignorance. But if we persevere in the search, asking God to reveal them to us, He will give us very humbling knowledge of ourselves and of our secret faults. With it also blessed comfort and communion, which otherwise we could not enjoy. The Coming of the Lord Let the blessed hope of the coming of Christ keep us ever on the watchtower, looking, longing for it, and hastening towards it. Would that we duly considered our accountability to Christ, who in the day of his appearing will judge the secrets of all hearts. Then we shall each be called on to give an account of his stewardship, an account not only of gifts of understanding and substance, but of daily employment and of all the minutes of the day. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. Prayer. It is a high place that is given to the prayers of the saints in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. If Christians only knew how their prayers for kings and governors are heard in heaven, they would not be meddlers with this world's politics. Every wish that the Holy Spirit breathes into the soul of a believer is a voice which enters into the ear of God. It is well for a child of God to pray for himself, but a more excellent thing to pray for others. God honors the spirit of intercession. We are too apt to set God a time and a way of answering our prayers. And even when our prayers are answered, we are often surprised and ready to faint. If we desire much communion with God and with Christ, we must not be surprised that the Holy Spirit come upon us as a keen north wind, revealing our own corruption and evil to us. When it comes, let us not say, how can we bear this, but rather, be thankful for God's wise answer to prayer. If we have not the spirit of supplication and thanksgiving, let us begin with the spirit of confession. When we pray, let us be sure God is hearing us. If we ask help, kindness, favor from a fellow man, it cheers us to observe the kind, attentive look. Let us by faith regard our unseen Savior and priest, and settle it in our hearts that our prayer is received. The answer will come in the best time. If we cannot comply with God's just demands to be singing and triumphing with Christ above, He will listen to His unbelieving, groaning children. He bows down His ear to hear their cry. When the Word of God enters the conscience, men pour out their hearts and deed to the Lord. Our need of prayer is as frequent as the moments of the day, and as we grow in spirituality of mind, our continual need will be felt by us more and more. In order to have power with God in prayer, there must be an undivided heart. If we would come boldly to the throne of grace, we must come obediently. Daniel made prayer and meditation of the scriptures the chief business of his life. Yet if we consider the circumstances in which he was placed, we shall see that few ever had greater obstacles than he in the way of seeking God. God gives, as a wise father, prized benefits to his supplicating children. When we ask for more communion with God, are we willing to part with all that hinders? Let us take heed that our ways agree with our words when we come to the mercy seat. It is a great help to us when we see that our prayers and our labors are to be as the grain of wheat falling into the ground. If we look for death and burial first, we shall be able to go on in patience, and in due time shall surely reap an abundant harvest. We ought to go to God with our matters, 
as altogether his. How great is our favor and power with God, for we are kings and priests unto God, his sons and daughters by adoption and grace. Let us take heed that we grieve not the Spirit who sealed us unto the day of redemption, and nothing will God deny us. John 15, 7. The best testimony that Stephen bore was his last, not when he was preaching and working miracles, but when he pleaded for his persecutors. For then he most resembled the Lord Jesus in patience, forgiveness, and love. When some peculiar pressure is upon you, be like Queen Esther, whose first request was the king's company. In each trial seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added. Your seeking first the removal of the trial shows that you need the continuance of it. We must not look on that only as prayer to which our lips give utterance. The wish of the believing heart is counted prayer by God. It is the smoke of the incense which ascends in silence before him. If a path be overgrown with moss and briars, it is difficult to trace it. If well frequented, it is plainly seen. Our pathway to the fountain of Jesus' blood should be ever well trodden by our confessions. Unbelief lightly esteems both our own prayers and those of others. We can never draw nigh to God in believing prayer, but the answer will be more than we had grace to hope for. Expectation from God is a precious fruit of prayer. A guilty conscience stops prayer, but a cleansed conscience makes prayer to flow. We may often have the spirit of prayer without the comfort of prayer. Conflict When the corruptions of the flesh like an armed host invade the soul, they aim first at the capital city, which is faith. Success there would ensure possession of the whole land. It is ever Satan's aim to debase the heart and conscience of the children of God. Their heart should be filled with Christ, their conscience ruled by his word and ways. Satan would entice away the heart from Christ and set up in the conscience a standard inferior to that of Christ's example. Oh, that the saints were not ignorant of Satan's devices, but willing to pluck out the right eye, to cut off hand or foot, rather than give place at all to the adversary. Let our affections be resting in Christ and engrossed with him. Then will all saints be dear to us in him, because they are one with him, and we shall please him concerning them. To prevent our attaining to this grace, or to spoil us of it, is the aim of the powers of darkness that war against us. It is only as we have rest in Christ, only as we have peace through faith in His atoning blood, only as we have the purged conscience with the heart's affections set upon Christ, that we have any strength to war against our spiritual enemies. It is whilst we are fighting against them that strength is given equal to the need, and we experience the precious sympathy of the captain of our salvation. Put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10-19 David put away the armor of Saul and went against Goliath with nothing save the weapons of weakness.